Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I am Brian Zimmerman with Becker's Hospital Review. We'll begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. We are looking forward to hearing your questions. Additionally, in about a week following the webinar, we'll be sending you a copy of the presentation to the email you use to register. At this time, it is now my pleasure to start today's webinar by introducing our presenters. Angela Maxwell has been a senior clinical consultant with Cardinal Health since 2015. She has nearly 20 years of critical care and perioperative nursing experience, with the last four in clinical leadership directing four departments in two facilities under the Surgical Service Division. Throughout her acute care career, Angela has been a leader focused on safety, supply chain, value analysis, and quality assurance. Her responsibilities included managing a staff of 100 employees, staff development, orientation, education, policy procedure development, and implementation, as well as developing organizational best practices. Her latest career accomplishments include co contributing her perioperative knowledge of proper cleaning and sterile processing safety in the OR, which was featured in a 2017 HPN and online article titled, Seeing is Believing, Right? Today, Angela educates and offers clinical guidance to Cardinal Health team members and customers alike, helping align their needs with the broad array of choices in the Cardinal Health medical surgical product portfolio. Trisha L. L. Boring is a certified nurse in the operating room. She received her associate degree in science nursing from Germana Community College in Fredericksburg, Virginia in 1995. Her healthcare career began in the operating room, completing the first Periop 101 program at Mary Washington Hospital in 1997. She received her, first, her RN first assistant certificate in 2008 from Delaware County Community College in Delaware, Pennsylvania. She received her Bachelor of Science degree from Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia in 2008. Angela, I'll now turn the floor over to you. Thank you. Hello and welcome everyone. Again, my name is Angela Maxwell and I am the Senior Consultant for Clinical Operations at Cardinal Health. I'm here on site at Mary Washington Hospital in Fredericksburg, Virginia, and with me today is our special guest, Trisha Boring. Trisha is the Assistant Nurse Manager of the OR here at Mary Washington Hospital, and I want to say thank you to Trisha for having us here on site and participating with us today. In the next few minutes, we're going to be discussing why it has never been more important to choose the right facial protection for each clinical situation in both the surgical and procedural settings. And we will see how ASTM standards were created to help you select the right mask every time. There are five key learning points that will help better prepare you and your staff for selecting appropriate facial protection. Some of the objectives listed on this screen are designed to help you be better prepared to choose the appropriate mask. So let's start with the first objective. Number one, after this presentation, you will be able to identify the two major classifications of masks and also be able to identify a third type of mask that is suitable for when surgical smoke or a known or suspected aerosol transmittable disease may be present, such as plumes during a procedure, or when disease may be present, such as influenza or tuberculosis. These are just a few examples of what we will be discussing today. The second objective is you will understand the risk associated with improper mask usage. And number three, you will be able to describe the purpose of ASTM International and its mask selection standards. In particular, we will be referencing ASTM F2100-11, which is important because it sets standard requirements for the performance of materials used in medical face masks. You'll also have knowledge and an in-depth overview of the three ASTM barrier protection levels. And finally, you'll understand the four F of how to properly select the right mask for each situation. So let's get started by sharing why Cardinal Health is uniquely qualified to help you. 
On this slide, we're going to be talking about cardinal health. People often ask me, who is cardinal health? And I always reply with, cardinal health is not only an industry leader, but it's the people at cardinal health that makes this organization extraordinary. It's a family-oriented environment with a diverse culture and not just a job, but a home for me. I couldn't be more proud to be a part of this great company. So here are a few facts about Cardinal Health. With more than 40 years of experience, Cardinal Health is not only a recognized leader in healthcare, but we are also top ranking when it comes to transforming healthcare supply chain services to help our customers meet the current challenges we face today around costs, revenues, and outcomes. As a supplier and leading manufacturer of medical and surgical products, we have an unparalleled understanding of the healthcare value chain. In particular, we have extensive expertise in personal protective equipment for the OR. In fact, we provide healthcare organizations across the U.S. with 722 million units of surgical and medical products every year. Another key strength, and maybe one of our most important ones, is our clinical support team ready to serve you. There are 2,500 clinicians throughout Cardinal Health, including a dedicated team to help educate your staff on the proper selection of masks for each procedure and setting. Again, I am happy to be a part of this extraordinary clinical team, and we as a team could not be more equipped to help provide you with the educational support on health and safety to your surgical team. With our combined materials management and clinical expertise, we're uniquely able to give you more of what you want most, and that is, it's a simple way to support your reputation by delivering quality care while at the same time decreasing your cost. Now let's turn our focus to math, starting with an important question. Why is choosing the right math important? There are three key reasons we want to talk about today. Number one is, the risk of facial exposure to blood and body fluids to healthcare workers is a common safety concern. And as you'll see in a moment, that risk is real. In healthcare today, there have been increased clinical emphasis on reducing healthcare associated infection. And there's also been a renewed focus on patient and staff safety, as well as quality initiatives. A catalyst for this effort has been the rise of new pathogens in the healthcare setting which we're seeing an increase in these pathogens, as well as antibiotic-resistant bacteria, or what we also know as the superbugs. And a good example of the superbug that we see today is MRSA, that's a common one. It's equally important to keep staff safe and protected from these superbugs, as well as the patient. As part of our own safety and quality initiatives here at Mary Washington, education is paramount. Our goal is to help our staff make better decisions and wear the correct mask for each clinical setting. Thank you, Tricia. Now let's turn our attention to the two major classifications of masks. The first classification is procedural mask, and the second is surgical mask. Let's talk for a minute about the differences between the two. What are the differences? We'll start with procedure masks. They are easily identifiable by ear loops and are used on hospital floors. Some other areas you may see in ear loop masks would be in isolation, in the sterile cores, the processing department, labor and delivery units have them, and ER and ICU have them for bedside procedures. I want to highlight that a good thing to keep in mind here is that procedure masks are not suitable for use in the OR. On the other hand, surgical masks are primarily used by OR staff and have two straps that secure the mask to the face instead of loose. How clinicians talk about the differences between a procedure mask and a surgical mask varies widely. There simply isn't a common language, language among clinicians, which brings up several challenges to healthcare workers. But to help overcome some of these challenges, Cardinal Health makes recommendations for usage based on guidelines established for the surgical attire guidance established by AORN are also known as the Association of Perioperative Registered Nurses. And based on these guidelines, it's important to know that only masks with ties and not with ear loops are considered appropriate for surgical settings. Another way to think about it is that surgical masks are designed for sterile environments and procedure masks are designed for clean environments. Great. 
Now we're going to be discussing a third type of mask, which is the surgical N95 respirator. This mask is designed to support hospital policies and procedures around surgical smoke safety. We will discuss several factors that play a part and when an N95 respirator should be selected. This type of mask is recommended when the need for evacuating surgical smoke that is generated by energy generating devices during operative or other invasive procedures. Some examples of this would be EFUs, lasers, and ultrasonic scalpels or dissectors. The N95 is recommended when any time there is a need for wearing respiratory protective equipment as a secondary protection against residual surgical smoke. Also note that while wearing respiratory protective equipment during higher risk aerosol generating procedures on patients with known or suspected aerosol transmittable diseases is recommended. Examples of these diseases would be tuberculosis, varicella, and rubiola. These are just a few examples I've listed here. As consultants visiting customers' accounts frequently, we have observed that it is common practice for staff to incorrectly select a standard surgical mask with ties for these at-risk procedures instead of choosing an N95 and leaving themselves underprotected and at risk. So now that we've reviewed the different types of masks, I'd like to hear from all of you on our first polling question. For question number one, since we just discussed classifications of masks, we would like to know, what masks are you using for ECU procedures today? Please select one of the following. A, I don't know. B, a surgical mask with ties. C, a procedure mask with loop. Or D, an N95 respirator. We'll give you folks a few minutes to respond. Okay, so it looks like the response overwhelming is that 41% are currently choosing a surgical mask with ties for this type of procedure. So it's good to know, hope you guys learned something today, that an N95 respirator would be the correct choice in this situation. So now that we have your feedback on mask ECU procedure protection, let's look at how the purpose of masks have evolved through the years. Masks were originally developed to minimize the risk of patient wound infection due to microorganisms that could be transmitted from clinicians via cough, sneezes, and droplets to the patient. Wow, things have really changed over the years. Today's masks are intended to protect both patient and clinicians from several risks, including new and drug-resistant pathogens transmitted by patient blood or other body fluids, most plume that can contain toxic chemicals and other irritants, and particulate contaminants that include dust dispelled by high-speed devices. And in my experience, the knowledge deficit is probably greatest here. It is not uncommon to walk into a, quote, dirty environment and see staff wearing an ear loop mask. Just last week, I was visiting an account where there was a total shoulder in progress, and four people in the room had on an ear loop mask, including the surgeon. Believe it or not, I observed this happening almost weekly. I actually had a discussion with the OR director and vaguely mentioned that I had observed this and she said she wasn't even aware that her staff had access to the ear loop mask and had no idea where they had gotten them from. So I do what I can do to educate while I'm on site. But the knowledge gap is significant here because the risks are real. And when I say the risks are real, what am I referring to exactly? Let's take a look at some statistics. One of the greatest exposure risks is to blood-borne pathogens, including HIV, HBV, HVC, and many others. The risk impacts 5.6 million healthcare workers, and it's one of the top five causes of injuries among healthcare workers. Here's an important fact to take away. Blood or blood products are involved in 63% of exposure incidents, 26% of OR 
blood exposures are to the head and neck of scrub personnel. 59% of blood and bodily fluid exposures are among experienced OR doctors. This goes back to the surgeon I observed with the ear loop mask. He was putting himself at risk by not selecting the appropriate facial protectors. That's just one example. 17% of blood exposures occur with circulating personnel outside the sterile field. Yet, 76% of OR directors make procedure masks available for their staff. Not only are the risks physical, organizations and staff found without proper use of PPE can be fined in excess of over 25,000 for each infraction. Thank you, Tricia. This leads us to our second polling question. We'd like to see how many of you are aware of the cost associated with exposure-related incidences or citations from staff-related injuries. Please select one of the following. A, very aware, B, somewhat aware, I'm sorry, B, somewhat aware, or C, not at all aware. We'll give everyone a little time to respond. So it looks like 59 percent of you are somewhat aware, and it's good to know, I hope we have shed some light on and brought attention to the fact that costs are in fact on the rise. So I hope you guys are, are aware and take note of that. And in fact, the most influential factor in choosing a mask is simply what's available at the facility. So let's take a look at that data. On your screen are statistics from a recent survey conducted among hundreds of OR nurses, non-OR nurses, infection control practitioners, and other clinicians on how their staff is currently selecting masks. Just recently, Cardinal did a market research study with a key group, and here are the results. As you can see from these results, availability of masks ranked first, followed by training, comfort, and habits. Ranking below those are the ASTM standards for proper mask selection. Only 44% of survey respondents rank ASTM standards as an influencer when selecting a mask. And that leads to a significant safety issue. Now we would like to hear from you. And this leads us to our third polling question. We'd like to understand how this group is selecting their mask today. So please choose one of the following. Which comes to mind first? A, you choose by what is provided to me. B, you're choosing based on what you learned in training. C, you're choosing for comfort. D, is it out of habit or what you've always used? Or E, are you leveraging the ASTM standard? And we're gonna wait a few moments for you guys to respond. Great, it looks like the results are in, and about 38% of you are choosing what is provided to you at your facility. So again, this is probably aligning with what we're seeing in the study, and this is a good education point <clears throat> to always leverage the ASCM standards when choosing a mask. According to the same study, 75% of participants use the incorrect PPE for the setting. That may lead not only to staff and patient health risks, but it also can lead to regulatory citations and fines. Following ASTM standards would help solve that problem, but according to studies, the awareness of the standard is low. 48% of OR staff are unaware of ASTM standards and the different levels of protection and a whopping 57% of face mask units sold in 2016 did not have or claim to have an ASTM rating. Tricia, what is your own experience with clinicians when choosing the wrong mask for the clinical setting? Making sure you wear the right personal protective equipment, such as the right mask, is an important part of perioperative training. At our facility, we provide training to all healthcare staff 
as well as a refresher training for our staff to help ensure that the proper mask is selected. Great. Thank you, Tricia. Incorrect selection of masks is a significant challenge across the healthcare industry. So now we're going to take a look at medical judgment from the clinician when choosing a mask versus the ASCM standards. While 84% of facilities surveyed have a mask selection protocol, more than half of clinicians have said they use their medical judgment when selecting a mask, even if that falls outside of the protocol. The encouraging news is that 95% of those surveys said they would change that selection if they had higher awareness of what the ASCM standards were. So let's take a moment to hear from you guys again in our final polling question. For our fourth and final question, we ask, does your institution have a current protocol based on ASTM guidelines? Please respond yes, no, or I'm not aware. This is just to get a sense from this group on where we want to stand with alignment to safety and compliance in mass selections around the ASTM guidelines. So it looks like over half of you, 53% are, are not aware um, if your institution has a current protocol on the ASTM guidelines or not. So I think it's just important to remember that when choosing the mask correctly, you are choosing based on the ASTM guidelines. So let's take a closer look at those standards and starting with the organization that sets these standards. This brings us to our next topic of discussion, which is ASTM International. Most people want to know what is exactly is ASTM International and what is their role? ASTM's main function is to test products to improve quality and enhance safety. They also define more than 12,500 international standards across a wide variety of industries and services. The ASTM organization has been in operation for more than 120 years, with over 30,000 volunteer members in over 140 countries around the world. It's important to know that when healthcare organizations globally are looking to adopt and implement best practices, ASTM recommendations have become a vital part of this process. So now let's focus on the ASTM standards that are relevant to our discussion today regarding procedural and surgical masks. The ASTM sets standards for level of barrier protection for masks. We're seeing here on the screen the definition of the three levels of barrier protection that are set by the ASTM guidelines. So we'll begin with level one. Level one is the lower barrier protection mask. Its general use is for low risk, non-surgical procedures and exams that don't have the potential for any aerosol, spray, or bodily fluids. An example of proper use of this level mask would be an air loop mask. You may see this in hospitals with visitors walking the halls with a mask to cover their face when they have a cold or if they want to protect themselves from getting a cold. You may also see clinicians using this mask for dressing changes and it's used for bedside procedures. The level two or moderate barrier protection it's for low to moderate levels of aerosol sprays or fluids, and we don't see this mask being used in hospitals much anymore. And the third is perhaps the most one to take note of, and that's the level three. This is the maximum barrier protection mask. This mask should be chosen for any situation that has the potential for exposure to heavy levels of aerosols, sprays, and body fluids. Cardinal Health also recommends this level as a best practice for supporting OR safety initiatives. A few tips to keep in mind on moving forward. When you are choosing a mask for the OR setting, it is strongly recommended to use a level three surgical mask and the one with ties and not with ear loops. This is due to the opportunity for high velocity blood and fluid exposure. Lower levels of barrier protection, such as the level one, may be appropriate in more general settings outside of the OR. So if you take away anything from today, please remember that when choosing the right mask, always look for the level of protection that is recommended by ASTM. 
And how are these levels determined? We're going to take a closer look. To determine if this mask is a level 1, 2, or 3, ASTM evaluates several characteristics. So let's discuss a few of these. You may have heard of some of these, and we'll just review them. Bacterial Filtration Efficiency, or BFE. This tests the droplets and the moisture exposure that is generated from coughs and sneezes. And then there's the submicron particulate filtration, and that is the filtration from solid matter. And an example of this would be protection from dust particles. We have differential pressure, and then flame spread, or what we might refer to as mass flammability. But I really want to focus on the highlighted one here. This is the one you see the greatest difference between the three levels. This is the mass resistance to penetration by synthetic blood. And you'll note the minimum resistance pressure in a level three mask is double that of a level one mask. This is why it is so important to choose a level three when you're in the surgical setting. You're getting double B protection. I also want to make a little side note here. I want to point out that it's common for not all manufacturers to test all the criteria that are listed here above including the performance factors that we have discussed as well. And this leaves the mask user at risk. It is very important to make sure that you are protected and your mask is ASTM rated in all five of these categories. I would also like to mention that it's important to recognize that procedural masks are also rated by ASTM standards. And the, note that the N95 respirators are certified by an organization called NIOSH, not ASTM. So now that we've covered the three levels, let's talk about the best practice use of ASTM standards to select the right mask for each clinical situation. And that leads us to the four Fs. Let's take a look at the four Fs and how they play a role when selecting a mask. There are filtration, fluid resistance, features, and fit. The four Fs can be a great tool when implementing best practice guidelines with mask selection. It helps the clinician to select the right mask while also addressing both safety and comfort concerns. So let's go a little more in depth into each category. For the first F we will talk about is filtration. The benefit of filtration is protecting us from smoke plumes or diseases such as tuberculosis. When in a situation where smoke is present or dealing with a TB patient, a high filtration mask is needed. And in such cases, an N95 respirator would be recommended in this situation. So move on to the next step, which is fluid resistance. You choose a fluid resistant mask where there is any chance at all of blood splatter or exposure to fluids. Level three surgical masks are recommended for these types of situations and should always, always be worn in a surgical setting. That leads us to our next, which is features. And I'm just going to highlight some points through here. Features refers to loops or ties. So remember that, the features of the mask when you're selecting for loops or ties. Remember when choosing a mask in the surgical setting, always use a level three surgical mask with ties for best practice. And we're also going to talk about fit. This is a big factor as most clinicians are now choosing a mask based on fit. Remember that if your mask is not a good fit and not worn correctly, it leaves you at risk. Even if you have selected the proper mask for protection, it must be secured properly. And we also have an added a bonus best practice known as the feel of the mask for comfort and breathability. It's just important to know that if one mask does not work or is not comfortable for you, there are many more acceptable masks available to meet your needs. And I'll give an example of this, and that is the duckbill mask that's being chosen over a flat mask. It's one of the most common masks chosen for the feel of it because the duckbill mask has an open chamber style. It allows for breathability and ease of talking. And most clinicians like it because they don't feel that suffocated feeling that they do with a flat mask. So the goal with remembering the four Fs is to always keep safety at the top of your mind and then to ask yourself, am I selecting the right mask to protect myself based on the ASPM standards? The key is to use these standards to support your choices around filtration and fluid resistance. Some other key points we want to remember about this slide 
is that it's equally important to know that even the right mask could put you at risk if it isn't worn correctly and secured properly. Cardinal Health has created a video that demonstrates the proper way to don and doff masks. It will be available and provided to you at no cost after this webinar. So, Tricia, what has your experience been with using ASCM standards for mask selection? Perioperative leaders are expected to do what's right to keep the OR staff safe. For example, here at Mary Washington, we have offered staff members options for the fit and feel that's most comfortable for them, while ensuring that each delivers the minimum level three protection appropriate for our setting. We do not permit or offer the procedure masks in the OR. We also partner, partner very closely with supply chain team to ensure awareness and appropriate selection of the surgical mask. We cannot always assume that people understand the topic and the risks. That's why education is so critical. Well, thank you, Tricia, for the valuable input. So, in summary of what has been presented today, it's important to remember that the health hazards of incorrect mask selection are real, and three out of four mask selection decisions are actually incorrect. You should always follow your hospital protocol for mask selection. I want to add that Cardinal Health is focused on safety and adopting best practice. We use the four Fs and ASTM standards for general guidelines and recommendations in appropriate mask selection. And again, we want to emphasize that ASTM level three masks provide maximum protection without compromising comfort and breathability. And in addition, N95 respirators protect when laser or cautery tools are used. If you need any assistance at all with training on Cardinal Health brand products, the Cardinal Health clinical mask team is always ready to help. We can provide additional resources as well, including a CE course and mass selection guide. Thank you all again for your time and attention today. We'll be happy now to answer your questions. Thank you, Angela and Tricia, for that fantastic presentation. We will now begin today's question and answer session. Please submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled, enter a question for staff and clicking send. We will try to get through as many questions as we have time for. We've got a, quite, a, quite a few good questions coming in here. Uh, we'll start with this one. Do you have any best practices on how to highlight this topic with our staff? Thanks. Okay, great. Tricia, did you have um, some input on this one? Yeah, I Some of the best practices um, as a guide, we typically follow the AOI recommended practices. And in 2016, when they revised the standard that um, discussed the N95s with use in the lasers, we would recommend that the practices be followed. We also will share um, the information on this recording at the Cardinal Health website after this webinar. Great, thank you for those insights. And we'll move along here to another question. How can we tell if we are using masks that are ASTM rated? That's a great question. Um, a lot of the ASTM ratings are on the outside of the box. If you just look at the box, the ASTM rating is right there on the outside of the box. That is helpful to know. And I've got another question coming in here. Sorry, we, had to, we wanted to add something to that as well. Oh, absolutely. Hi, I'm Megan Phillips, the marketing manager with Cardinal Health, and I just want to call out um, the fact that oftentimes you're providing masks or dispensers and may not have visibility to those boxes. So um, I think one of the things that Tristan and I had discussed is just don't be afraid to ask to see those boxes or have those conversations with your teams as well. Um, and oftentimes, uh, as we said, manufacturers may test for know some of these material qualification standards but not all of them and um, would not qualify as uh, a completely ASTM rated mask. Good point. Great, thank you. Uh, and this audience member says, my OR staff says it takes too long to wear a mask with ties. What do you recommend? I, um, I've heard this as well in my OR, and quite honestly, you want protection over preference. 
Um, it just takes, in a you know, standard test comparing one to the other and applying, it just takes a few seconds longer. Um, but the seconds longer does take, it enhances your protection extensively. Um, and so it's worth the extra two or three seconds to tie the mask. And it's also notable, like we said, if there's one mask that you don't like, we have other options as well. Fantastic. We've got some more questions coming in here. Um, this audience member wants to know, uh, so we use masks that say laser use on the box, but they're not N95. Shouldn't these be safe? I think that's a good question to raise, and it's always good to ask questions of your peers or your director within the department. Um, you do want to look for the NIOSH on the packaging. Um, and if you don't see it, it doesn't hurt to call the company to validate or verify. And I think that it's important to highlight that this was um, presented by ARN in 2016, so it's very possible that um, your manufacturer of choice may not have updated their standard packaging and recommendations as it relates to this um, recommended specification. Thank you for those answers. And this next question here seems like a good one to close our discussion on. So what other tools or information do you have to share with us? We have lots of information available. Um, before we have highlighted that we have a CBE course or an online um, course that's available that you can take at your leisure. Um, it's essentially understanding facial protection and um, great details of information that can be provided there. We have an infographic that we'd like to share with you as well that you can share with your teams that highlights these risks and summarizes um, the importance of ASTM and mass selection. Um, and also um, mass selection guides and um, product brochures that um, highlight the importance of this standard as well. Great, thanks for sharing those. And that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank An Angela and Tricia for their excellent presentation and to our audience for participating today. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars.